was great to also have our first day of kids Sunday school this morning. Are there any other announcements that anyone would like to share? Any joys and concerns? As uh, Brother Jim White would say, if you're interested in all-inclusive vacation package, I have a deal for you. Uh, this year, our uh, Brethren Disaster, is going, we're going to uh, Dayton, Ohio, June the 13th to the 19th week. So if you're interested in going helping somebody uh, get back into their homes from a tornado, uh, please let me know, and I'll see if I can't line you up. And I also have another announcement for uh, volunteers. The Valina Brethren Disaster Group has joined up with Camp Bethel. Camp Bethel is in the need of building some dormitories for a summer camp. It's, I think it's in the Adventure Village. It's some open concept uh, dormitories that they need for uh, summer camp this year because of COVID. So if you're interested in coming and helping out build these uh, dormitories, there's two dates on the books in May, May 15th and May the 22nd, which is both Saturdays. Uh, we usually start about eight o'clock and finish around four, but you don't have to stay that long if you don't want to. But if you would, you need to go to uh, sign up on uh, the website, Camp Bethel, Virginia, dot org backslash volunteer and sign up the sign up is for uh, lunches uh, Camp Bethel is providing a warm box lunch for you and that'll give them an idea and know how many to fix if you didn't catch that website it's in the newsletter there's a flyer in the newsletter that has it and it's a, a flyer on the bulletin board at the phone at the phone so if you can help out please come and join us thank you any other announcements or joys and concerns this morning? Will you all join me in prayer? What have we done, Lord? We want to praise you, so we splash your words on the screen on the wall with brightly colored and powerful images. We shout your praises with hands held on high. We teach and preach your word, but we don't always listen carefully for you. We are so busy trying to shout above the noise of the day that we don't take time to really listen and know you. The voices of the prophets spoke to people long ago who were too busy and anxious to hear. Their words streams in the winds of time and have now come to us. We need to pay attention to your message offered through them. You are our God, the God of creation, the God of power and love, whose mercy is offered to us. In Jesus' time, he proclaimed the good news through words and actions, reaching out to those who were troubled, alienated, cast aside. He offered healing and hope to those others turned away. Help us to learn that you alone can heal us and fix those areas in our lives that are wounded and twisted. Help us to understand that you alone can offer to us in a new way of life through Jesus Christ. Remind us again that as we have spoken the names of people and situations that concern us, praying for your words of healing touch, that the same touch is offered to us in Jesus' name. Lord, we need to let go of our control issues and place our trust in you. Amen.
I'm going to break the rules of order and make an announcement because it's actually a praise announcement. Uh, my son, Benjamin, who some of you and most of you know, was engaged last week, and it's certainly wonderful. He's engaged to his high school girlfriend that he's been dating for nine years, so in about ten years, I should have a wedding announcement for <laughs> each of you, so hallelujah. Thank you. So uh, let's please stand if uh, you are able for our call to worship this morning and our invocation, prayer, and opening hymn. Come and praise God in the company of the God's people. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Great are the works of God, full of glory and majesty. Our God is gracious and compassionate. Our God is merciful and forgiving. Our God is faithful and trustworthy. Our God is just and good. So come, let's worship God together. God's praise will last forever. Let us pray. Dear Lord, open our hearts and spirits this day to hear the great good news of your power and presence with all of your people. Fill our hearts with rejoicing as the words are proclaimed in song and story. Enliven us and remind us that you are with us through the pillar of fire, through the magnificent words of the prophets, through the ministry and love of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing and join us in our opening hymn, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. Joining us today will be a recorded sermon by Dan Rudy, who is the pastor of the Ninth Street Church of the Brethren. 
He and his wife, Tabitha, have a daughter named Evelyn, and they live in Roanoke. Originally from the Glade Valley Church of the Brethren, he began pastoring in Roanoke after attending Bridgewater College and Bethany Theological Seminary. The title of his message today is Deeds of Power. Scripture for our sermon today comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, uh, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as their scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, and they kept asking one, one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? And he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. I invite you to pray with me. Lord God, open us not only to receiving from you this day, but open us to expecting when we worship, you will be present. That when we encounter Jesus, our lives will be changed. Open us to expecting that the faith and the life that we proclaim have eternal significance. This we pray through Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. As we enter the 11th month of our confrontation with a global pandemic that few, if any of us, imagined could ever last this long, I wonder if any of us have even a remote sense of what is normal anymore. When we talk about going back to normal, what does that even mean at this point? While it is certainly less than an ideal reason for doing so, one of the things that this pandemic has almost forced me to do, drug me by the scruff of the collar, kicking and screaming into, is a personal self-examination of what I consider to be normal. And while this examination of normalcy has hit all areas of my life. I want to focus on one area in particular today. The area of worship. When I come to a time of worship, whether it is in person, in a church building, online, in a recorded service, or on a meeting platform like Zoom, in a large convention center like an annual conference, or outside like on Vesper Hill or in one of the fields of Bethel, what exactly is it that I expect? What am I coming to worship, to see, to hear, to experience, to do? Do I come to that set-apart time of worship, expecting to see human skill on display? Do I come expecting to marvel at the ability of the musicians? Complain about the inability of the preacher, or otherwise evaluate the human beings who are functioning as leaders? Do I come to experience togetherness with other people? Hopefully a togetherness fostered by our shared faith in Christ Jesus. But at bare minimum, a togetherness experienced by 
occupying the same space in the same time for the same purpose? Do I come expecting to connect with God in some mystical way, to experience the power and presence of the Maker of heaven and earth? I know for myself, these are questions that in normal times I tend to gloss right over amidst the busyness of my schedule, amidst everything that I have to do, amidst all of the preparation for the particular content of worship. What do I expect when I worship God? And what do you, brothers and sisters, expect when you worship God? Whether here in this sanctuary, outdoors in creation, or in some other location, what do we expect to happen when we worship the Lord our God? Do we expect God's power to be displayed before our very eyes? Do we expect God to be present in real and visible ways? Or would we be surprised if the power and presence of God were to break out before us? In all of my study of Scripture, I cannot remember a single instance where a biblical writer records what an individual or group of people was expecting before they experienced an encounter with God. Usually, we are left to infer from their reactions to the encounter that whatever it was that they anticipated, it was not that the power and presence of God would break out before them. For the biblical writers often use words like awe, surprise, and fear to describe the ways that human beings react to the power of God being poured out before them. At the foot of Mount Sinai, the Israelites were so awed by the power of God that they asked Moses to hide his face from them because his face radiated with the power of God. Jacob was so shocked when he woke up from his dream that he renamed the place Bethel, meaning house of God, saying, I have been in the presence of God, and I did not know it. And lest we think that it is only groups of people who are awed by the unexpected power of God, no less a spiritual giant than the prophet Elijah when he had fled Ahab and Jezebel to Mount Sinai also became overwhelmed by the outpouring of God's power in the sheer silence. The Israelites, Elijah and Jacob, are but several examples of this common phenomenon. When the power and presence of God appears to human beings, it is rarely because the human beings have anticipated, expected, or sought out God. I believe that the events of today's scripture passage started out like any other Sabbath day in Capernaum. Mark tells us that the disciples went with Jesus to the village and that he entered the synagogue and taught we do not know, but I strongly suspect that Jesus was expected in that particular synagogue that day. Mark does not record any commotion for us at Jesus' presence or resistance from the local rabbi to Jesus' teaching. All of this leads me to believe that this was either a prearranged visit or that there was some normal procedure for when a traveling rabbi showed up at a local synagogue. During the 19th century, the Brethren had a practice where traveling ministers from other congregations who showed up unannounced were given the privilege of speaking first in the worship service before the local ministers. I do not know enough about the practices of the synagogues at the time of Jesus 
But it is not all that unreasonable to suspect that before email, telephones, or a reliable mail service by which a visit could be prearranged, that a similar system may have been operating in the synagogues of Galilee to allow those who were called to traveling ministry to share their teachings when they happened to be in town. When Mark does record some surprise or astonishment, it has to do with the character of Jesus' teaching. Not that it was Jesus who was doing the teaching. Mark records that the worshipers in the synagogue at Capernaum were astounded that he taught as one having authority and not as their scribes. Now often, Mark's brief recordings of various encounters are preserved in much fuller accounts in the other Gospels, where we get some content to what Jesus was saying and doing. Matthew, Luke, and John do not provide any further elaboration on this particular incident. We have no idea what scripture passage Jesus used that day, what his sermon was about, what his appeal was, or what by implication he wanted the worshipers to believe, to think, or to do as the result of his message. And I suspect that the reason that we have no idea what Jesus preached about that day is not because Mark gives us the Cliff Notes version of everything. I suspect it's because most of the crowd forgot the exact details of Jesus' sermon because of what came after it. As they were marveling at his teaching, a man with an unclean spirit stood up and began to disrupt the service. As is Mark's style, Mark doesn't give us much background about this man. We do not know if he was a regular worshiper at this particular synagogue, whose demon was usually quiet during the service. We have no idea if anyone else in town even knew that he had an unclean spirit for this outburst. With Mark's usual brevity, it could have just as easily been that this man was an outcast who wandered into the service midway through Jesus' teaching, and that everybody else gave him the stink eye as he interrupted their worship. But it's also just as likely that he was someone who was there every Sabbath day, suffering quietly in the pew, a person whose inner turmoil only emerged for the rest of the world to see, because of the presence of Jesus. Whatever this man's backstory, there was something about the presence of Jesus that led the unclean spirit within him to cry out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, Holy One of God. I wonder who the us that the unclean spirit referred to was. Was the us, the demons and the fallen powers who had afflicted the people? Or was the us, the worshipers in that synagogue at Capernaum? We don't know. Never mind that this is the first undisputably public confession recorded in Mark's Gospel that Jesus was indeed the Holy One of God, and that it came from an unclean spirit, not from a believer. I want you to pause with me for a moment and imagine that you were a worshiper in that synagogue. We all have our expectations about what worship should look like and what it should not be like. And wherever we fall on the worship wars between traditional hymns and contemporary Christian music, we all have some sort of expected order to the worship service. 
Now sometimes we butt heads because that expected order that one brother or sister has is different from the expected order that another brother or sister has, but I dare say that nobody who has even the, the most remedial experience of Christian worship shows up with no expectations whatsoever. And I dare say that's the same in other religious traditions. That nobody who has even the most remedial experience of a synagogue service shows up with no expectations. And even within the call and response tradition of predominantly African American churches, where the congregation is expected to participate in the sermon in audible and visible ways, where standing up and shouting is not uncommon, there are still expected words and phrases that the congregation might call out in response to the preacher. It's not out of the ordinary for someone particularly moved to stand up and shout amen or to say, go on, go on to the preacher, or yes sir, or yes ma'am. Or to stand up and raise their hand in praise. Or maybe even in some more uh, free traditions of that, that tradition, uh, to, to move around in the aisle a little bit. But I do not know of any Jewish or Christian tradition where it would be considered acceptable behavior for someone to stand up and challenge the teacher, the preacher, or the rabbi. Or to swipe the microphone away from the teacher or the preacher to go off on their own little tangent in the middle of the service. In fact, I suspect that if that happened in our worship service, you and I both would be so stunned that we would have no clue what to do. I hope I will respond faithfully. But I won't know until that happens. Please don't take this as an invitation to make me find out what I would do. While we do not know what we would do if confronted with a similar circumstance, and while I suspect that the congregation almost certainly had no idea what to do with this man's outburst. Jesus was not similarly paralyzed. Jesus quickly diagnosed that this was not simply the case of an obnoxious person acting out. This was not simply someone who needed to be educated about the social norms of worship, that there was something deeper, something in the spiritual realm that led to this incident. Understanding that this was not the man himself, but the unclean spirit talking, Jesus quickly rebuked the unclean spirit, ordered it to be silent and to come out of this man. Even in religious traditions that speak of exorcisms much more frequently than our own, most folks do not come to public worship expecting to see demons cast out before their very eyes. And even if we are among those who believe that much of what the ancients diagnosed as demons and unclean spirits are more accurately diagnosed as mental illnesses today, I dare say that most of us who would dismiss this as a mere mental illness also do not come to worship expecting to see people healed of mental illness before our very eyes by the Lord our God in front of them either. Clearly, the folks at the synagogue at Capernaum did not expect exorcisms, because when the unclean spirit left the man, they looked at each other with amazement. And they kept asking each other, who is this who teaches with authority, and who even the unclean spirits obey? But more than their cross chain more than their whispering to each other, if you need any more proof that this was not what the worshipers were anticipating when they went to the synagogue that day, look no further than verse 28. When Mark tells us that word spread throughout the region, 
about Jesus. I suspect most of you that have, that have been in the church for any length of time are somewhat familiar with the way that rumors and innuendo spread in church circles. I have to say, I have yet to hear the first church rumor that goes, you know that church over there I visited last Sunday and things went exactly as you would expect. And yet I've heard many a rumor shared through the grapevine about this thing or that thing that was out of the ordinary, that was unexpected, that was different. The fact that the rumor spread testifies to just how out of the ordinary this deed of power was. Too often when we approach biblical accounts of miraculous healings or other deeds of power, we get so caught up in the extraordinary nature, nature of the deed itself and how far outside of our normal experience it is that we have a difficult time relating to it. We get so caught up on that difficulty that we lose sight of what the deed of power points to. The whole purpose of this story near the beginning of Mark's Gospel is not for the worshipers at Capernaum or for us, the readers, to marvel at how far outside of the ordinary this was. The purpose of this story, the reason that Mark preserved it for us, is to testify to the power of God resting in Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. This encounter at Capernaum speaks in real and powerful ways to the way that when Jesus shows up, lives change. When Jesus shows up, people are transformed. When Jesus shows up, we are taught, we are healed, we are empowered. Our question today is not primarily about whether we believe in unclean spirits or exorcisms. Nor is our question primarily about what the worshipers of Capernaum were expecting. Our question, sisters and brothers, is about what we expect when we encounter our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we expect that the power and presence of Jesus made manifest through the Holy Spirit will change our lives and the lives of those around us? Do we receive Jesus' teachings and example as having authority in our lives? Or do we expect that worship will be just another hour out of our week? Something that we do by force of habit, but that we do not really believe will make all that much of a difference. Folks who went to the synagogue that Sabbath in Capernaum all those years ago, encountered the presence of God as they worshipped. And dare I say it, they were never the same. I pray that we too would come into the presence of Christ Jesus, expecting that His power and His presence will not only change us, but that Christ Jesus will also change the world around us. Proverbs 3 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all of your produce. Would you um, please join me in giving in the plates in the back or using the Tathly app? And would you please pray with me? Giver of all gifts and source of life, we gather here with hearts full of gratitude, and yet we confess that at times we spend unwisely impulsively and compulsively. Giver of all gifts and source of life, 
We gather here with hearts full of compassion, and yet we confess that at times we respond with less than our true capacity. Help us to share generously, supporting what matters most, the mission of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing our closing hymn, Lord Whose Love Through Humble Service. As we depart from this place, I hope that Jesus shows up to you and that his power and presence surrounds you as we work and worship apart from each other until we come together again. Amen.